Well, thanks for coming, everyone. I'm going to get started because uh, half an hour is not very much time. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, something called DIDCOM and the self-sovereign internet. Um, to get started, I just want to make the point that when I talk about this, I'm not, I don't want to debate the relative merits of different autonomic identifiers like peer dids and carry and ADI. Uh, I think all of them can apply to what I'm going to say. Um, and if you don't know what an autonomic identifier is, that's good because that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, I will be watching, um, or hopefully a little bit trying to watch the chat, um, uh, to to see if there are questions so uh, feel free to ask if you if, if you have them um, so when Descartes didn't say I have a birth certificate therefore I am um, we don't spring into existence because some administrative system provisions an identifier for us and no single administrative regime be it a birth certificate or a driver's license or whatever, or even a collection of them really defines us. And so uh, when I talk about self-sovereign internet, what I mean by that is that sovereignty is the source of our authority to act, represents a, uh, a root of trust, if you will. I'm going to talk in some detail about what that means because the root of trust determines the domain and a degree of legitimacy for an identity system. So when we talk about identity system architectures, um, first of all, I want to point out my belief that identity systems don't manage identities, but rather are built to manage relationships. And they provide the means necessary for us to remember, recognize, and rely on other parties in that relationship. And to do so, they use identifiers, which are handles that we use to name the thing that we're remembering, recognizing, and relying on. Um, so identifiers are issued to or created by a controller who, by virtue of knowing the authentication factors, can make authoritative statements about the identifier. For example, example when you authenticate to a website, you are using um, a password usually to make an authoritative statement about the identifier and claim it. The controller could be a person, an organization, a, a software system of some kind, and it might be the subject that the identifier refers to, but that doesn't have to be the case. Okay. Uh, authentication factors can be things like passwords or key fobs or cryptographic keys or almost anything else. But really one of the things we care most about is the strength of the bindings between these three things. And the architecture of the identity system has a great deal to do with the strength of those bindings. So in an administrative identity system, like the ones that we use for almost everything, some administrator is asserting the binding between an identifier and the password. And the administrator owns or verifies the identifier, even if it's your email, they're still, when it's used as an identifier in their system, they are essentially asserting the binding between that. And, and they're assigning it to a particular controller. The only binding that's particularly strong in this administrative setup is the one between the controller and the passwords, because typically we allow the controller to generate the passwords themselves. Now, in a ledger-based um, system, uh, which I think of as algorithmic, right, we have a ledger which is essentially registering the bindings between the identifier and the public key. And usually the identifier is derived from the public key in some way. So we get strong bindings between all of these. Um, the binding between the controller and the identifier is strong because the, the, the identifier is derived from public keys that the controller has generated. And then finally, the primary thing we want to talk about today is this idea of autonomic identifiers. So in this case, the, the identifier is um, and the keys are self-certifying. 
and the person is their own root of trust. And I don't have time today to go into the details of why that works and why it's so. We'll talk a little bit about it. But uh, n nevertheless, the idea here is that the identifier is um, derived from the key, but the, the source of truth about what that identifier means is held in some uh, cryptographic structure, which I've labeled here as a key event log. So in order to use these identifiers, we have a system of wallets and agents. And um, I'm going to be speaking primarily from the viewpoint of Hyperledger Ares, uh, although many of these concepts can be generalized to, to other systems. So this is a diagram that's meant to show uh, something on the left connecting with something on the right. Uh, and the something on the left could be an individual or an organization, or it could even be um, a natural thing like a cow in this picture or a man-made thing like some internet of things uh, device. Um, and they do that using some system of agents and wallets. Now, from a purely, uh, to, to, to be purely uh, um, precise, we would clearly dis delineate between agents and wallets. And I'm going to do that in this slide. And then from the rest of the talk, I'm usually just going to say agents. And you should understand that to mean an agent and a wallet. Because agents and wallets are almost always deployed in pairs. The wallet is the thing that is um, is essentially the distributed key man or the, the it's the key management system, whereas the agent is the software system that uses the keys in the wallet to do some thing. And we'll we're going to talk about what those things might be. So this diagram also distinguishes between edge agents and wallets and cloud agents and wallets. And you can see that uh, an individual having an edge agent and another individual having an edge agent could have a direct connection, say, via Bluetooth, or they could have a connection through some cloud um, uh, set of agents that, that may even route messages between uh, from, from one agent to another. Okay. These agents are speaking a um, protocol called DIDCOM. And um, that is really the basis of what we're going to talk about today is this idea of a protocol, a messaging protocol called DIDCOM, that a series of interoperable agents, whether they be edge agents or cloud agents, can use to communicate with each other. So how does this all get started? What happens is um, Alice and Bob exchange DIDs. And you can see here that Alice has created a did, uh, one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D, and Bob has created a did, which I won't read, but you can see it. And they have exchanged them. And so now Alice knows the, the did that Bob gave uh, or generated for her, and Bob knows the did that Alice generated for him. In addition to exchanging the did, which is the identifier, they have also exchanged information about the um, public key that is associated with that did. And they are keeping track of these in key event logs. And um, they each have this key event log and without going into all of the details, uh, you can think of the key event log for this particular relationship because each relationship will have its own key event log as being a uh, conflict-free replicated data type, a CRDT, uh, something like a Google Doc, uh, although much more cryptographic. Um, and both Bob and Alice can verify that it is correct and that the um, if, if Bob rotates his key, for example, then Alice sees that key event and uh, the cryptographic chain uh, informs her that, that this is a, a valid key for Bob and that it's been signed by the previous key and so on. So, um, you know, some people call these micro ledgers uh, because they have this kind of cryptographic property. But nevertheless, the, the very foundation of this whole idea is that did exchange creates this did relationship and that Alice and Bob can have a self-certifying 
um, relationship between these keys or, or between themselves based on these keys and, and uh, identified by the did identifier. Um, th this whole idea of how this works, uh, the indirection of the did was uh, brought home, the importance of the indirection was brought home to me uh, this past week uh, when uh, someone sent me an email and it happened to be encrypted. And I sent him back a note and I said, sorry, I can't read this. And he says, oh, don't you use this key anymore? Turns out it was a key that I had exchanged with him in 2011. And of course, I had no idea what it was, didn't remember anything about it. Ne nevertheless, um, <laughs> he still had it in his in his system. And, and so a better distributed key management system is clearly going to benefit a lot of people. Um, and, and that's really the basis of DIDCOM. DIDCOM is a messaging system based on these DID relationships. Alice can have as many DID relationships as she wants. Bob can have as many as he wants because they're based on DIDs and uh, those DIDs are linked to public keys. They can sign messages to each other. They can encrypt messages to each other. And um, even if they rotate the keys because they've been lost or, or, or whatever, the did relationship can remain. And the key event logs will sync up the keys between Alice and Bob so that they can maintain their relationship. Um, yeah, a little bit later. So um, this diagram is just meant to show um, a number of did-based relationships that Alice might have. Uh, so you can see that Alice has one with Bob, like we've been talking about, but she also has one with Carol. Carol and Bob happen to have a did relationship. Alice also has a did relationship with, um, with Bravo Corp and with a tester corp and with, or, or tester org and with certify corp and you can see that um in this case um a tester org has issued a credential to alice and she has used that to present a proof to certify corp and that credential is not based on peer dids but rather is um, the root of trust for the credential is rather a public did that is written to a ledger which allows certify corp to actually validate the credential using that public did and the, and the credential definition that's associated with the credential so, so the, the idea here is that did-based relationships can form a complex network uh, and any individual can have as many of them as they want. Um, it's important to note that uh, Alice in this diagram has five different peer-did relationships. She has created a different peer-did for each one of those um, relationships. She's not reusing the same peer-did in each relationship. She's using a new one. Now, because um, of the secure and interoperable nature of this, um, DIDCOM represents a secure network overlay, uh, very different than, say, TLS, which is another example of a secure network overlay. But TLS is um, very specific to a, spe to a certain application, namely um, HTTPS. Whereas uh, DIDCOM is a general purpose messaging application and um, importantly, it allows other protocols to write on top of it. And that is uh, a very, very important feature because it creates this idea of the self-sovereign internet that I use to title this talk. Um, so unlike say WhatsApp or Signal, which, um, you know, can talk to each other, but can't talk uh, between the two platforms. Uh, using uh, wallets that speak DIDCOM, uh, you know, a Trinsic wallet can speak to another Trinsic wallet or an ID ramp wallet or a Lisi wallet or an ESADIS wallet or any other wallet that happens to be, um, or agent rather is probably the more proper term or any other agent that happens to be uh, interoperable with the Hyperledger Aries uh, interoperability profile. Okay. So we've talked about DIDCOM is secure, private, interoperable, transport agnostic. But the thing I want to focus on now is the idea that DIDCOM is extensible. Um, so to do that, we're going to talk about TikTok toe protocol. 
And I am going to uh, try to um, share. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to start sharing a different window so that I can show you this. There we go. Um, I can find it now. Okay, so this is actually what I'm showing you on the screen right now is actually the GitHub um, uh, Aries RFC protocol for tic-tac-toe. So this is actually a defined protocol in the Aries um, uh, RFCs that Daniel Hardman put together really just to, to, as a sam simple protocol uh, to show how protocols could be defined on top of Aries. Um, so in my uh, lab at BYU, um, Bruce Conrad, who works with me, uh, put together a version of this inside our Pico system, which is a uh, system uh, that speaks agents. And so I have for here a um, agent for Alice, and I have an agent for Bob. And um, you can see that Bob doesn't have any connections. Alice has a connection to agent book um, for historical purposes. And we're going to create a a connection between them. So this is an invitation. If we looked at it, it would look like this kind of complicated uh, QR code, but that's not really what we're going to do. We're just going to copy it. We're going to come over to Alice and we're going to paste it in here and Alice is going to accept it. She now has a connection to Bob. Bob has a connection to us. We refresh that. Um, and Bob is going to start a tic-tac-toe game with Alice. And he's going to say, I'm X, and he's going to let them move first. And so now Bob is now in this game. If we come over to Alice and look at her um, connections with Bob, you can see that she has a message from Bob. It says, let's play tic-tac-toe, I'll be X. And she could say, okay, here we go. Right? And she's just sending that. That's just a message that she's sending Bob. But she's going to come over here, and she's going to click O. And if we go over to Bob... Um, he sees O, he clicks X, so on and so forth. We can see that, you know, he saw her, um, her, um, her messages and is playing tic-tac-toe via the protocol. So it's just a simple demo to show um, that these agents can have protocols put on top of them. It turns out that if I were to uh, go into this, if we were going to Bob, you would see uh, this is a system of called Picos, KRL, not nearly enough time to go into it, but you can see that he has uh, rule sets for a sovereign agent and for the DIDCOM plugin and one for tic-tac-toe. And all of these are what's allowing this game to go forward, but it's all happening over DIDCOM using a protocol that's been defined uh, by Bob. So um, let's go back to... the slideshow and um, you have to get going here. So, in it, so there are some protocols you, you might, if you're familiar with verifiable credential exchange inside uh, Hyperledger Aries, you might think of that as just, oh, something that's implemented in the code. But in fact, issuing a credential and presenting the proof from a credential are protocols which are defined on top of didcom um, so they're not just like you know this kind of hard-coded thing inside aries they're actually protocols which allows credential pro credential issuance and proof presentation to be done in an interoperable way by anyone who can speak these protocols on top of didcom and you could imagine there could be lots of other protocols that were defined on top of didcom you could have protocols for delegating or commenting buying and selling 
uh, contracts, putting things in escrow, scheduling. There are almost any uh, workflow that you want to make interoperable, you could think of as being a protocol, which is defined on top of DIDCOM. Now to um, think about what the possibilities might be, I want to talk for a minute about the Internet of Things. Uh, so this is the current model for the Internet of Things, which I call the CompuServe of Things. Uh, so in this case, Alice has a uh, Baratza coffee grinder. And uh, since it's the current model of the Internet of Things, she has to download Baratza's app and it connects to Baratza's administrative IoT system that maybe speaks to the coffee grinder through some API and intermediates essentially Alice from her device. But we could imagine a different model. This is our uh, the diagram I showed you earlier, but now uh, Alice has this coffee grinder out to the right. And if we ignore everything else, we just see this. So instead of Baratza intermediating Alice's relationship with her coffee grinder, she instead has a peer distribution relationship with her coffee grinder. And she has one with Baratza. And it, interestingly enough, the coffee grinder itself has a peer did relationship with Baratza. So what might we do with that? So one of the most obvious things that you might do with that is Baratza might issue firmware updates. Uh, so since the coffee grinder has a peer-did relationship with Baratza, they can offer a firmware update over the DIDCOM um, messaging system that the peer-did relationship gives them. And Baratza, I'm sorry, the coffee grinder can use uh, Baratza's public DID um, to, um, to look up the current key that Baratza is using to sign things and validate the signature of the firmware update uh, all by itself. And uh, Alice can now be confident that she can tell her coffee grinder, yes, as long as you can validate uh, the firmware comes from Baratza, please go ahead and update your firmware whenever it comes along. So that's kind of the obvious kind of thing. Um, you might imagine that Alice needs to prove ownership maybe not of a coffee grinder, but of something, right? I just made a customer service request yesterday. I had to prove that I had bought something. So we could imagine the coffee grinder issuing an ownership credential to Alice and Alice using that to prove to Baratza that she actually owns the coffee grinder. Of course, she could use it to prove to anyone that she owns the coffee grinder if that were important. Um, and there's all kinds of interesting sub-scenarios here about what happens if Alice you know, sells the coffee grinder, uh, lo lots of interesting scenarios in this one. Um, one of the most interesting to me is the idea that the coffee grinder itself could be at the intermediary in a customer support relationship. So Alice, if the coffee grinder has some kind of problem, Alice would tell it to initiate a uh, customer support contact and uh, it would connect with Baratza. And of course it knows a lot more about itself and the problems it's having than Alice does. And so it could just communicate with Baratza. Baratza knows that it is one of their products because of the, um, you know, the, the um, credentials that the coffee grinder might be able to prove to Baratza. Um, so lots of interesting scenarios with that. There's a company called Hero, H-E-A-R-O, uh, that is pursuing this actually with uh, DIDCOM and verifiable credentials. One of the most interesting ecosystems is vehicles. I had a company um, several years ago that did, uh, that used this exact model not not with uh, DIDCOM because it didn't exist yet, but but you know, Modulo, uh, the actual DIDCOM, used this exact self-sovereign model in uh, vehicle uh, connections. You know, vehicles have lots of relationships, owners, manufacturers, financers, manufacturers, I mean, dealers, insurance companies, other vehicles, um, uh, traffic signals, uh, lots of interesting things. Uh, so one of the scenarios we might imagine is a didcom based protocol for buying and selling uh and this is a very interesting kind of relationship right because if alice wants to sell her truck to doug uh she might list it she might tell the truck actually itself to list itself on some brokerage uh when doug finds it they would set up a didcom relationship that then could be managed through some buy and sell protocol uh, they could each have didcom relationships to their uh, financing 
they could uh, have one to the DMV to insurance companies, and uh, you know then there would be a protocol for actually transferring ownership of the truck from Alice to Doug. Uh, one of the interesting things about that, um, at least from a uh, Pico standpoint, is that. Uh, Alice, when she transfers the truck, the truck's going to know a lot of things about Alice. So from an information hiding perspective, uh, she may wish to uh, transfer the maintenance records. In fact, Doug may insist on that, but but not the trips that she's taken. But she could keep all of those in a shadow truck, kind of a device shadow that would, that would uh, keep uh, all of the things that Alice knew about her truck can be fully functional, at least from a data standpoint. Uh, as, as Alice completes this transaction. Um, so uh, PICOs, uh, we're experimenting with the self-sovereign Internet of Things. As we've seen, PICOs can be agents. Uh, we recently updated the engine and, um, you know, Ares has gone through a lot of transitions. So the demo I showed you is actually um, based on uh, the um, the old um, Aries uh, profile, uh, not the new one. So we're working on uh, incorporating that, making DIDCOM the primary messaging method as opposed to HTTP, which you know Picos have been around since 2008. So um, some transitions there, um, and exploring the use of DIDCOM protocols uh, between Picos for various things. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, you can go to picolabs.io. There's code and quick starts and lessons. It's all open source. And we have some interesting projects that uh, we would welcome people helping us with. Um, so I've uploaded these slides to Hyperledger so you can get them. Follow through all of these um, links if you're interested in going further. And of course, I'm always available for questions. A lot of the stuff that I've talked about today, I've written about on my blog at windley.com, um, but feel free to pop me an email or, or to, if you have other questions that you want to ask. So that's what I had. I don't see any uh, questions um, or anything in the chat. So uh, unless somebody has a question that they'd like to uh, put forward, we're getting close to time. Um, so we have a question, uh, any SDK for DIDCOM? Yeah, if you go to Hyperledger Ares, uh, Hyperledger Ares is a um, whole set of open source code. There is a um, Python um, version. There is a uh, JavaScript version. Ours is a Pico version. The Python version is Akapi. Uh, we call ours Acapico naturally because you know who wouldn't want to go to Acapico, and um, th there are there are other implementations of that. But yeah, um, yeah, Acapi is not just Didcom. It, it is, but it is Didcom in the sense that what it's doing is it's implementing Didcom-based protocols. So, like I said, credential issuance is a protocol on top of didcom so so the whole uh airy system is didcom based yeah and i've uploaded the slides to hyperledger um so so that uh, should be available on the hyperledger system if not send me a note and i can drop you something um yeah so how can we use self-sovereign identity on resource constrained device that's a really interesting question and that's why picos exist Right, so the coffee grinder may not have all of the resources it needs to be a fully functioning uh, system. Uh, a temperature sensor, for example, probably isn't going to have its own wallet and be managing keys. That's why Picos exist. Picos are device shadows that can, that can work with resource constrained devices to offer them these kind of agent services. So that's, that's exactly what Picos are designed to do is to use this. Um, any alternative to Aries? Well, uh, um, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. What I would say is the Aries is a set of specifications. Um, there are Aries code that implements all of this, but for example, the Pico stuff is not part of the Aries project. It just uses the Aries specifications to be interoperable. Um, and yes, Picos are all open source. 
So we are at time. I probably ought to end uh, so that you can get to the next session, but I appreciate your time today. Please feel free to ask additional questions uh, by sending me an email or on Twitter or whatever. So thanks a lot, guys.